For those of us Montessorians, Susan is a well-known name. She has done much groundwork for Montessori for how many years, Susan? Uh, 40. 40 years in Montessori. She's also doing a workshop tomorrow for parents and teachers. I just want to bring to your attention her latest endeavor, which is a book titled Child of the World, a fitting title for this conference. And she com combines her experience, knowledge, and wisdom about Montessori and Montessori practices for teachers and parents. It's a, it's a great read, and I certainly hope that you will Purchase a copy is available on Amazon and all through, also through NAMTO. In every system of education, aside from the academic curriculum, there's something that I call the hidden curriculum. And that sometimes has a lot more to do with what kind of a person one becomes. In Montessori, there are many different elements of the hidden curriculum, but I'm going to give uh, examples, some examples of three of them. These three are service, concentration, and happiness. Service in a Montessori school is not a class. It's not something that you do for your college application. It's something that begins with the very first day with even the youngest child. Children learn how to take care of plants, how to take care of animals, how to take care of the environment and each other. And in Montessori, that word other has a very different meaning because the children also learn that they are part of the world community. They learn that through puzzle maps, through civilization charts, through timelines. And so service to other has a very broad meaning. One example of a Montessori student's service, we may have heard of this young lady, at age nine, Severin Kolis Suzuki, a Montessori student in Canada, founded the Environmental Children's Organization, ECO, dedicated to learning about and teaching environmental issues. At age 12, with other ECHO members, she raised enough money to attend the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. There she presented environmental issues from a youth perspective, where she was applauded uh, by for a first speech to the delegates. This video has since become known as The Girl Who Silenced the World for Six Minutes. And it's available on her Wikipedia uh, bio. I think you would probably enjoy hearing it. As another example of service, I'd like to read part of a letter I received from a Montessori graduate who was volunteering for an environmental NGO in uh, India. This morning, two friends and I went to the Mother Teresa orphanage. All of the kids there are ones that no parents will adopt because they have some kind of physical or mental defect. A lot of them had polio and they couldn't walk. And one little girl was only about a foot tall and had a very deformed face. She had no arms either, only hands growing out of her sides. We spent a lot of time with her. There was another boy who had very weak legs, and we spent a while moving his legs for him and trying to get him to exercise them. Eventually, he began to straighten and bend at the knee, and then he got very happy and started laughing when I touched his feet and moved his toes. This has opened up for me what is important in life and what is not so important, and I know the feeling might not be with me for very long, but hopefully each time it sinks in a little deeper and stays with me longer. Now, it's clear that service helps the person who's receiving the gift of service, but it also helps the person who's giving the service. As an example, I want to tell you a little about a student I had in a Montessori um, elementary class in the Virgin Islands. Lang was 12 years old, and he had been, until this year, attending a, an a alternative free school where he didn't really receive much of an education. He couldn't construct a sentence with proper uh, punctuation. He didn't know much about math, and it became clear that he had a lot of work to do. He 
even though all of the students were very understanding and supportive, he still felt bad. Then one day, a little girl named Paloma started attending the primary class from the same small building. When her parents left, Paloma started crying, and Lang went to that class to see why someone was crying and comforted her. From then on, Lang became attuned to Paloma's voice, and whenever he heard her cry, he would drop whatever he was doing, even the bat on a softball field, and rush to her side. He became Paloma's guardian angel. And this being needed gave him exactly what he needed to get through all of the work that he had to catch up on. The second uh, element, and there are many, and remember I'm just talking about three. The second element in the Montessori Hidden Curriculum is concentration. Concentration is respected and not interrupted at every level of Montessori. When a new child begins attending, maybe at age two or three or four, the teacher watches for that moment when the student starts working on something and suddenly becomes very focused and concentrate, concentrates. Because we know that that's when the transformation is going to begin. Walking on the line in the Montessori primary is an example available to any child at any time. And it's very much like a walking meditation. Developing this skill of concentration helps us academically and mentally, but it also helps us develop patience and become kinder, better, more peaceful people. Many great leaders have taught us that peace begins in us. And I think that if we can carry this, the value of this concentration with us in our work, and especially this weekend, you will see that it helps you listen to others and reach consensus. Here is a quote by Dr. Montessori early on in her career, in, in, when she first started noticing what happened to children when they had deep levels of concentration. When the children had completed an absorbing bit of work, they appeared rested and deeply pleased. It almost seemed as if a road had opened up within their souls that led to all of their latent powers, revealing the better part of themselves. They exhibited a great affability to everyone, put themselves out to help others, and seemed full of goodwill. And we've been seeing this for over 100 years in Montessori schools all over the world. And the third, the third uh, element of the hidden curriculum I'm going to mention is happiness. All of the teachers, parents, students, administrators here know the value of happiness in Montessori school. Children who are happy in their work learn, they retain, they remember for the rest of their lives the, thing that, the things that they learn. But having happiness as a curriculum goal, I think is very rare for schools, except in Montessori. I would like to share some feedback that a 12-year-old Montessori student gave me after seeing the video about life in Ladakh, India, called The Economics of Happiness. It's about localization compared to globalization. She realized that she could have a part at home in learning about and preserving the wisdom of ancient traditions and caring for each other and protecting the environment. And she gave me this feedback. Remember, she's 12. Kids our age usually think there's nothing we can do to be helpful. But this video gives us a lot of ideas. And since the future, of, in the future, the world is ours, we might as well start now. If we think about it, no one can be truly happy when there is a lot of suffering in the world. Many people hear about all the suffering that is going on, but we think there is nothing we can do, so we just push that information aside. But inside, somewhere inside, there is a little voice that tells me that the suffering of others prevents me from being truly happy myself. Now I understand that there are things I can do to help, and then I don't have to hide the truth from myself. I can listen to that voice inside and do what I can every day to help. Then I can be truly happy. Last year I was giving a parent workshop in Russia, 
and during the workshop, I showed a short video of a Montessori primary class. I asked parents um, to watch uh, the video, but look for examples of children concentrating, taking care of or helping each other, and being happy in their work. Of course, there were many examples. At the end, one of the fathers said to me, do you think it is fair to provide such a happy and positive experience for children when they are going to have to face the harsh and unhappy reality as they grow up? My reply was, and is, that when we talk about creating a better world, where people care for each other and for the environment, where people are happy and peaceful, we have to do more than talk. When children have daily experiences like this in school, they know how good it feels, and they learn how to make this way of living a reality. You Montessori students here today know what I'm talking about. You have lived this reality, and you are equipped to create the kind of world that we have been waiting for. Thank you.